Welcome to Unlocking Your Truth, another podcast by Dr. Leslie Phillips. Hello listeners and welcome to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey. Hello again. We are broadcasting on 101.7 FM across the Fraser Valley on CIVL from the unceded territory of the Stolo Nation. And if you are a new listener to Unlocking Your Truth, let's just introduce you to the show. Unlocking Your Truth is a talk show about metaphysics and spirituality. And every week we have a different topic that we focus on. And this week is no exception because we have a wonderful guest on this evening. And our focus is going to be all about relationships. And we're going to talk about the mistakes that people make in their dating and love lives and how to better approach their social lives so that the mistakes that they make will not from their past will not ruin their future. And I know that this is gonna be a really popular show because uh, when you write into us listeners, there are many of your questions relate to your relationships. So we're really delighted this evening to have Bruce Starr, who is the love coach. And I'm going to um, give you some information about Bruce and then we will be all ears to hear his relationship wisdom. So Bruce has been on a 44-year self-study on several different philosophies of life. Having many of the top experts on love and relationships as his teachers and mentors. And he's an internationally known speaker. He's a television and radio show host and producer. He's written four books. And the most recent book is called the Love Coach's, Gu- Love Coach's Guide to Teenage Dating and Relationships. That's very exciting. And he's currently hosting the Love Coach Bruce Starr Facebook Live video shows. And he's soon going to be hosting executive dating weekends at exotic resorts around the world. So Bruce, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be here. You and I have been... Uh connecting and talking and speaking for you know a few years now and it's great to be able to do a show with you yeah you know, it's wonderful it's wonderful to be able to do a show together and I think last time I was on your show so <laughs> it's really great to have it's you only on. taken three years for you, no. for you to invite me back on your shows so. <laughs> I can't tell her why didn't you invite Bruce on the show she, <laughs> no not yet I like you already <laughs> Well, Bruce, 44 years. I mean, that's quite the resume in terms of, um, you know, studying, studying life and life experience. How did you first get started um, into the relationship business and helping people with their relationships? Where did it all begin? You know, I knew relationships were really important to me, but I was so confused with them and by them. Uh, I never understood why I couldn't have the kinds of relationships I wanted with the the persons I wanted to have them with. And I couldn't understand that if I didn't really care that much about someone, I couldn't shake them. They they were so insistent and they were persistent and they, and it, it just wasn't working for me. And I wanted to find out why it wasn't working. And the first thing that, uh, that I did was I learned about astrology because I wanted, you know, uh, I I saw that it worked and anything I see working in for some people, I want to see why it works. And I realized I could learn so much about people by different astrology charts and not just finding out their sun signs, but people are different. And some of the ways that they're different, you can find out how different they are by astrology. And then I started uh, tapping into my own uh, psychic development and intuition. 
And that's why, you know, with all those things, the one most important thing to having a healthy and satisfying relationship is bringing spirituality into it. Because if you don't, you're going to be working on ego needs and just bodily needs. And, you know, when I was younger, that's exactly what I was doing. (laughs) But I realize as I get older, you've got to raise the vibration. You've got to get the upper chakras going and igniting. And, uh, you know, that's what I've been doing all these years. Very cool. And so... So tell us a little bit about the astrology and um, what your take on that is, what, what your take on that is now. Um, does it well, really work? Do you match people up on the basis of their astrological signs and it's going to, it's going to automatically work out because the, the correct, the stars are aligned or, yeah. You know, you know, it's my secret weapon because when I do relationship coaching with people, uh, and they tell me that they, they're in a relationship with someone, I find out the charts of both of those people. I don't necessarily tell them that, but I find out the date of births and the times. And putting together a compatibility chart for people is really very, very helpful. And uh, there's a whole lot of information there, and it gives me tremendous insight into their relationship that, that I can also tune into using all my other knowledge. And that combination of astrology and all this knowledge that I've picked up over the last 40 years, a very powerful combination. So have you ever been surprised at two star signs that you thought were completely incompatible actually getting along? That's a very interesting question because my first love was a Capricorn and an early Capricorn. There's a difference between early Capricorns, which are December Capricorns, and later ones that are uh, later on in January. And uh, this Capricorn, by the way, I swore off early Capricorns the rest of my life (laughs) since I had this experience with this early Capricorn, but she was a tremendous teacher for me. I mean, the good times were the best, but the, 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 the bad times were really horrible and kind of heartbreaking. And it, it's because of her that I'm doing the work that I'm doing now, learning about relationships, learning what makes them work, learning what doesn't work. And uh, I, I thank her all the time for being a person in my life who was my teacher, even though she was two or three years younger than me. Uh, she's, she's my teacher and she's taught me a lot. And, And because of her, I've gone on this huge study to to learn out how relationships work and why they don't work. Don't say it too loud, though. She might want to cut. (laughs) Well, you know, I doubt if she's listening. You know, she's she's not on Facebook or anything. So, but I think we're safe for now. (laughs) Oh, so, um, so do you think that that's a common feature for someone who's going to be able to? Um, create a fulfilling relationship that they have to be be willing to learn from the ups and downs of relationships as you were saying earlier you have to bring spirituality into it Um, but so but I'm sure that there are some people that don't bring spirituality into it and are and and don't learn and then there are people who are um, you know more likely to be introspective and say, well, what went on in this situation and what can I learn from it? Well, I I learned something that right now I'm going to share that just about anybody alive uh, will uh, benefit from. When we were 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, 19 years old, many of us fell in love and we fell in love for the first time and it was magical. And hopefully it went on forever, but for many people, whether his or her parents broke you up, or she broke up with you, or he broke up with you, or your parents broke you up, many times it ended up in in broken hearts. And we all remember a first love. Uh, if, if, If we were broken up with, there was really nothing more painful. Because with that first love, if we came from a fairly functional 
home. That first love, we just opened up our hearts completely and took, we took every risk and opened up ourselves and there was no reserves. And if our hearts were broken, it was an awful experience for us. Yeah. Some people took that experience and decided never to fall in love again, never to be vulnerable like that again. Those people switched from feeling relationships to thinking about relationships and looking for the best deal. Those people in their minds, choosing with their minds rather than their hearts, are the people more in their egos and without spirituality who are proceeding, not from their heart, not from their soul, but from their minds looking for the best deal. Now, when I, sometimes I say this to Canadians and they say, I don't know anybody like that. I think we all do now. Uh, and it's just the way it is. It's the way it is of the world. But our goal should be to return back to our hearts and risk being vulnerable again. Because that's the only way we're really going to feel love again. If we're, if we're not feeling satisfaction in our relationships, it's because we're in our heads and we're protecting our hearts. That, like they say, the, the, the longest trip you'll ever take is the one from your head to your heart. It's a tough one. It is. It is. And if you've been hurt, and I'll tell you something funny about guys, Leslie. Guys are, if we got our hearts broken, you know, you girls had someone to talk to or many people to talk to about your broken heart. Maybe your mom, your sisters, your, uh, your, your aunts, your cousins, friends galore. You had someone to talk to. Who do the guys have to talk to if they got their heart broken? You think Joe and Tony walked into a gym and Joe said, hey, Tony, I'm feeling really vulnerable. My girlfriend broke my heart, and she told me that I've got a small thing, and she told me I was a bad lover. And Tony, I just don't know what to do with my life. Is that going to happen? No. So you ladies have a chance to recover. Us men, if you ever wondered why we're so weird, it's because we're retarded, most of us, when it comes to relationship, because we got our hearts broken. And we've never recovered. <gasps> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Words of wisdom, right? Write that down real quick. It's yeah, the truth. But you know, yeah. it's so interesting thinking about that first love and that heartbreak of the first love. It's funny because, I, you know, it's not something that I've thought about myself for a really long time. And I can actually feel myself feeling really sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> right now because I remember I remember um you know I don't I don't even remember who it was with but I, I what I do remember is that my dad um felt so bad for me that he bought me this um these two fluffy toy kittens <laughs> to replace him <laughs> yeah and it was so sweet of my dad because he loved me, you know, so much. And it was like his little girl. And at the same time, I'm sort of in between. I'm not really a little girl anymore. <laughs> I've got these two fluffy kittens to, to comfort me. And I just, I remember at the time sort of thinking, oh. And he was, he was so happy that he'd, um, you know, done something nice. And now I look back on that and I just, oh, I just love my dad so much for, <laughs> for it. I didn't get any kittens. See that? See that? Guys have it rough. I just, I just got my friend stabbed me in the back by stealing my girlfriend. Oh. Well, I, you know, it's funny because I also had that experience where I went to the disco um, as, a, as a teenager. And then one of my friends, I, I went with a date and then one of my friends left with my date. <laughs> It happened. You know, it's, when it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. Be glad that it happened in the beginning rather than falling deeper and deeper for someone and then having them change their minds. People don't change their hearts. That first love, those feelings for that first love, pretty much still in there. Not that you're in love with that person anymore, but feelings from the heart don't change. 
our minds change all the time. And if we decide who we're going to be with, thinking about it, who's going to be the best person, who has the most money, who has the best sexuality, who has the best body, who has the best job, who's driving the best car, who lives in the best neighborhood. That's, those are relationships. And people right now are listening to that and they're saying, what's wrong with that? I'm doing that. <laughs> Everybody I know is doing that. Well, it's not the best way. Yeah. It's not going to get you, uh, it's not going to open up your heart. It's not going to refill your heart. And uh, yeah, we can get by doing just what, it would, what I just described, but that really has nothing to do with love. It's a substitution for love. But I, I do... They, they look for that, they get it, and once they get it, then they sit there going, this is lousy, what do I, what do I want this for? And then they go out and do the exact same thing again, though. It's really interesting how people are creatures of habit, mm -hmm. even when it comes to their love life. You know, they're so invested in this approach to finding a rich guy, uh, a, a sexy girl, that they can't get off it. And it's, they're stuck. They're on this wheel. And, you know, it's like that, 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 that rat or that mouse that's on that wheel. And, and uh, uh, Leslie, that's why I'm doing, eventually going to be doing these uh, three-day weekends and eventually week-long events where people who have everything that they need in their life, they've, they've fallen for the idea that if they wait and don't get married when they're young, if they wait... They have the money and a successful job. They can have anybody they want. Oh, my God, how is that working out? And women, women were told that if they no, don't get married now, forget about this love stuff. If you go to college, maybe you'll meet a doctor or you'll meet a lawyer. And, you know, how's that, how's that stuff working out? It's really not working out the way it was planned. And so there's a, a challenge for us all here to find love again. Because as I told you before, once you get your heart broken, you know that full pie that you were offering that person? I didn't talk about my pie theory yet. But when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, you offer this full pie. It's just so lovely. And it's so everything. And you're so excited. If you get your heart broken, you never offer that full pie again. You might offer part of it. You might offer some of it but you never quite offer that full pie again. These three-day weekends are going to be for people that express themselves just like you said. They went for the bucks. They went for the sexuality. They went for the guy with the, the car, and it just didn't work out. I want to put together people who realize that doesn't work out, people who have everything but love, and we're going to talk more about that when we come back. Yes. Oh, I didn't yeah. interrupt you. That was for Leslie. That was for me. <laughs> yes. Well, listeners, you're tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey and with Bruce Starr, the love coach. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk some more about heartbreak. We're also going to talk, we're remembering when we were teenagers and we're going to talk about teenage heartbreak a little bit. We'll be back after these messages. Welcome back, listeners. You are tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey and Bruce Starr, the love coach. And before the break, we were talking about heartbreak and we were all just reminiscing and remembering what it was like to be a teenager. And that first time that you fall in love, when you feel so much love inside you, you can't, you can't imagine that anything will go wrong because that love is so pure, isn't it? It just feels... And then when it does go wrong, as it inevitably does, because more often than not, the first love is not the one that ends up being the long-term one. Oh, it is so very, 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 very painful. And so- you know that what, the, the average individual now is having three relationships, uh, three marriages. They're getting married three times, three divorces. That's commonplace. Yeah, and that used to be pretty, if someone was married three times, it was like, hey, you know, I'm staying away from that person. And now you're saying that's quite common. Yeah, yeah. We're, also, ma also, we're, we're making we're a lot of mistakes is the problem. Sure. And, you know, whether you, whether you connect with a love coach like me who can get you off that wheel or some other love coach, uh, you know, in businesses, when they run into trouble, they hire a consultant. 
that saves them hundreds, millions of dollars, because that consultant knows how to get them out of trouble. But you know what? People aren't doing that anymore for their relationships. People should be hiring relationship coaches to help them to get off that wheel that they're going on, making the same mistakes all the time. People need to be willing to have enough self-esteem to call in those relationship coaches to help them with the most, perhaps the most important thing in their lives, and that is to have love. I know we came to this world to feel love, to accept love, and to give love in return. Everything else is just secondary, and we've kind of totally gone off that path. Yeah. So, so Bruce, what's the difference? What do you think the difference is between a love coach or relationship coach and a marriage counselor? Well, I think a marriage counselor is someone who has uh, been studying books. You know, they have degrees and they're studying books and they're learning from other people's books. You know what? I've been studying from philosophies on life, from some of the greatest teachers. And a relationship coach, unless they're coming from actual practical experience, um, I think that people might be doing themselves, hey, listen, a good marriage counselor is great, but not every marriage counselor is great. And I say, go to marriage counselors. I don't, do whatever you think is right to help yourself, but do something. And if you come with, you know, if you come uh, to me for help, I'm not going to sit there and go like this and rub my chin and listen to you for 45 minutes while you talk about the woes of your life. I'm going to be much more interactive with you. I'm going to be coming down on you for the things that you're doing that aren't going to help you. And you're going to have to be a strong personality to, number one, admit that the way you've been going isn't working, and number two, to be open to another way that could be totally uh, unknown to you. So, but it's because you know how important love is and you have to be willing to do just about anything to come back to that space that felt so good for so long. Definitely. Definitely. I, I know that I've experienced the marriage counselor once and uh, I went through three sessions and that was it. Uh, I mean, he sent my ex-wife and I home and sit, to sit back to back to each other. And we each take seven minutes to tell each other, well, I think no, it was seven minutes to spend uh, seven minutes telling each other what we really appreciated about each other and then what we hated about each other. I came away from that experience, not the same man anymore. I was not a happy individual. That, that really, that cut me to the quick and it was very hard to come back from that. So what you're talking about is many times doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists are working with your head. Are there anybody, is there anybody out there working to open up your heart again? That's the big difference. I should have answered that question that you gave me two or three minutes ago that way. You don't need any more help trying to figure out what's in your head. It changes. It's like a computer. It takes in information. It spits out information. You see someone over there. You like that. All of a sudden, you see someone over here who looks better, and you change your mind. No, man. You've got to get working. You've got to take that trip that you said, that nine or ten inches from your, from your head to your heart. And that's where the work has to be done, opening up your heart. And when I do these three-day weekends, we're going to be doing group work with uh, 15 guys, 15 girls, 18 guys, 18 girls, where we're going to be doing group work, and we're going to find ways to stay under one roof for three days so that if you're not going to have to say something stupid if you're attracted to someone. You're going to get to see someone. You're going to get to witness them. You're going to get to watch them, and you're going to get to hear them, do group work with them, and at the same time, do exercises where you'd be opening up your heart and that's where you can really meet some terrific people. People who have everything but love, and they got lost in the part where if I have everything, I should be able to find someone to fall in love with. It's not, not as easy as people think. So, so these events then, they're, they're for singles. They're for singles to come and work on themselves and potentially meet people. 
Yes. So what's it like there in, in, in modern times out there on the dating scene? What's it like for, for, for <laughs> I sound like an old lady, don't I? What's it like for single people nowadays? Is it, is I it am so it glad. Yeah. I am so glad that I'm not single now. Because on top of all the other difficulties, on top of the increased baggage from rejection and disappointments and online dating and all the baggage that we, it gets higher and higher and higher. That makes it really, really tough to trust. Okay. But here's something that's happened in the last 20 or 30 years that's made it, I'm not going to say nearly impossible, but has made it so hard for people to meet each other. You know, women have gone through a, a wonderful time when they got out in the working world and there was a women's movement and they, get, they, they, they have so much more confidence and they competed for the jobs that only men held before, which is really wonderful. Women are, I don't know why that women have always fought for equality because I always thought women were smarter and better than we were. So why they want to bring themselves down to equality with us is something, is something else. But besides that point, uh, women, the problem that's happened is women have gotten so masculine in their approach for work and for jobs that they have found it terribly hard to turn off that masculinity or they haven't even thought about turning off that masculinity when it comes to dating. So women have sort of changed the game in the last 30, 40 years. Men, we're the same we've been for 10,000 years. So we're kind of lost because we were the masculine assertive ones before. And now with women being masculine and assertive, there's a whole lot of headbanging going on with two strong people going at each other. And it's not comfortable for women to be with a super aggressive, assertive man. And because men have not known what to do with women who are so suddenly aggressive and assertive, we haven't known how to satisfy you or what you want from us. Yeah. So men, as a as a, uh, a response to this, have become much more receptive and not feminine, uh, you know, in, in sexuality, but feminine and receptive in their energy. And we found that if we would just wait for the assertive, aggressive women to approach us, we can get lucky once in a while and have fun. And if we don't do that, it, it doesn't seem to work out. That's been very problematic because men, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to be. Women have gotten so masculine and assertive that what they're finding out is that they don't really want to be masculine and assertive in their relationships. Yeah. And when they get together with a, a, a man who's turned feminine and receptive, they get bored with that eventually and it breaks up the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand what you're talking about very, very much because I, I used to work in the corporate world and um, I, used to f I used to feel very masculine in that role. And, um, but it's how we as women have perceived we have to behave that way in order to climb up the corporate ladder because that is a very masculine world. And that masculine world has not been receptive to a, a feminine approach. And so we end up morphing ourselves in order to mimic the behavior of what is the standard behavior in the corporate world. So yeah, I, we, I, I, I empathize with women who have ended up doing that really. Yeah, but then when you're out, then you, you see you're out there eight hours, 10 hours a day, uh, you know, like in the grind, you come home, to somebody else who's been out there eight or 10 hours in the grind. And what's happened is there's no more, there's no relationship there anymore, uh, male, female. Now you've got two masculine energies mm -hmm. going at each other and it doesn't, 
it doesn't play well. It, it, it just doesn't play well. Right. First of all, men, men don't want to fight and battle with women in bed. That's not the way we've done it for 10,000 years. We don't want to do it. You remember the movie Jerry Maguire when he had that very pretty redheaded girlfriend? And there was a perfect example of two very masculine people coming together. It could be very exciting. It could be very sexy. And they can have a great time together, but it's not going to make for a long-lasting relationship. So here's uh, – I used to study with a lady named Dr. Pat Allen out in California. She was an unbelievable lady. She used to pack movie theaters in, in uh, Santa Monica and West Los Angeles with people from the ed- entertainment industry, producers, actors, actresses, directors, casting directors, managers, who – who bought the idea that if they get powerful, that they're going to be able to have anybody they want. Boom, it hasn't worked out for them either. So she addresses a whole movie theater full of people who are miserable with all their power and their success. And she said, women, you can have it all, but you have double work to do. She says, if you want to have a successful romantic relationship, you have to get back into your feminine at least on these dates. And she suggested something as common as this. Get home from work, put on that hot hot bath, put some lavender in there, light some candles, and sit in that warm bath for a half hour and let those masculine energies come out of you. Put yourself back in your feminine. And because that's the only way relationships are going to be successful. A strong masculine man, a feminine receptive female has worked for 10,000 years. Just ask Fred Flintstone and Wilma. Just ask (laughs) Ralph Cramden in the, in the, in the honeymooners and Alice, Mm. those relationships worked because you had a strong masculine male. Now, that doesn't mean anybody's weaker or stronger than anyone, but they both recognize their, their skills and abilities, and they both respected or cherished each other for their skills and abilities, and that's what makes those relationships work. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I also can see how, how it's happened just as a facet of the way life is for most people, because um, I think a lot of people are so busy you know, maybe they're married, maybe they've got a job, maybe they've got kids, and they're just pushing through the day, whether they're male or female, they're pushing through the day. And that's a masculine energy. You know, I've got to get the kids up, give them breakfast, take them to school, get to work, go in this meet, you know, you're just pushing through the day. And so. So that's where you have double the work, you have double homework. If you want to have a successful relationship before that date, You have to get yourself back in your feminine, your true self, and relax. And when he opens up the door, don't take control. You know, let the the male lead the way, which is what he wants to do. He wants to be Fred Flintstone. Fred Flintstone wanted to be the provider, and he wanted to be respected. And, And Wilma wanted to be cherished. And those, that combination of relationship works. But women, if they want to have a, a loving relationship with the man that they respect, they have to do double homework and they have to get back into their feminine, even when they have that successful, hardcore job. So let me ask you about, and when we get, I want to go into this a bit more after the break. Let me ask you about the teenage male. The teenage male. Because he's grown up, now he's grown up in that world where the role mother, model of the mom and, and dad is not like your mom and your dad or my mom and my dad, you know, who, who still had those masculine and feminine roles. So are, they, are the kids growing up confused? Do they still have those natural instincts that you're talking about? What does it look like in the teenage world? Yeah, it's very difficult because... They're in the mechanized world. They're in the computerized world. And computer is all up here in the head. And you don't hear them talking about heartfelt relationships. You don't hear them talking about 
risking their heart and falling in love. You remember all those songs from the 50s and the 60s, even if you weren't around in the 50s and the 60s, about that heartfelt love, and they, and they just love that, their girlfriend, they love their boyfriend, you know, uh, waiting for your man, and you don't hear them talking about that. So that whole generation that's in their heads, that's on computers, they've got a lot more work that they're gonna have to do if they're gonna find happiness. And that's why I, that's why I'm glad I'm not in the dating scene because I can't text fast enough. I've learned to two, two finger type pretty fast, but thank God I don't have to do that anymore. And what do you think about all these Thanks dating apps? Oh, we've got to go for a break. So, so yeah. listeners, you are tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey and Bruce Starr, the love coach. And we are talking about relationships and what, 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 what are the characteristics of a relationship that's likely to work? And, uh, and Bruce has written a book about teenage dating. And so we're going to talk about that when we come back after the break. Welcome back, listeners. You are tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie Corey and our guest this evening, Bruce Starr, the love coach. And Bruce, uh, your latest book is a love coach's guide to teenage dating and relationships. And before the break, we started to talk a little bit about how difficult it is um, for young people these days. And uh, there's a couple of things I'm curious about asking you about. Um, <laughs> um, so one is all these dating apps now that people are swiping right and swiping left and, you know, connecting with people. And then the other is, um, pornography on the internet because you know that didn't exist when we were younger and now i just imagine that young people are, are inundated with all of that and it must be giving them a, a completely skewed or specific view on what a relationship is and what sex is so i just wonder if you can comment on those two things well that's why i wrote this book because i feel like if teenagers uh don't get some relationship coaching. If they don't hear the right things, if they don't get the right messages from their parents, if they come from broken homes. You know, when I was growing up, my mom was home, my dad was out working, and I felt secure and I felt good. But now the kids, the, the father's not there, the mother's working two jobs, so she's not there. And kids are learning on their own, some in the streets and gangs, and others from their 14, 13 year old friends who think they know something about relationships. That's why I wrote this book. This book is going to help teenagers everywhere in the world because this young girl is going to make friends with a relationship coach. She doesn't realize he's a relationship coach, and they're going to meet on and off for two, three, four years in a park. And she's gonna learn things about relationships that she would never learn from her friends or from any place else. I don't know where young people are gonna learn right from wrong these days. I really don't know. That's why I wrote this book, because I think that this information has to get out there. They don't have parents to rely on. They don't have a mom to rely on. They don't have brothers. Everybody's so busy trying to do something, make enough money to survive. And these kids are all lost on their own. So the other thing you brought up are these dating services. Now, I think dating services can be fantastic. People can meet people that they've never met, the one across town, across the state, across the country, whatever excites them. But here's a little bit of the problem with that. The reason people are going to those websites is because they've gone into their heads about relationships and they're just looking, swiping and looking and making judgments with their eyes. Only women are doing it too. Yeah. It used to be men did the assertive masculine thing and chose for what the, what the woman looked like. Now the women are doing it and choosing men for what they look like. So we're totally in our ego. So 
here's what happens. If people get their hearts broken because they're getting disappointed, rejected, where do they go when their pie is empty? They turn to the internet <laughs> with empty pies. Yeah. They're so upset. They're so disappointed. They're coming with an empty pie. And who are they going to meet on the internet? Another person with an empty pie. Now, we've all heard people falling in love online. They can. If they've been working on themselves and building up their self-esteem and building up their beliefs and spirituality, and if they happen to meet someone else online who's also working on themselves, it could work. But I would say nine and a half out of ten times, both of the people online are there because they have, in a way, given up on relationships and just want something. And they're reaching out on the internet to find somebody, but it's all in their heads and very little from their hearts. Even though the other person is saying the right things and warming their hearts, really what's happening is they're, they're stimulating their minds and not their hearts. Tough, tough way to, to find and meet people because if you get disappointed and you get your heart broken, the guy doesn't show up, he disappoints you. You're at a restaurant, he never shows up. Uh, you, you go out together, you have sex together, he doesn't call again. Oh my God, it's so much more potential for getting devastated and disappointed when you're dating on the internet. It's so, so much less personal. Yeah. The other thing, there's a lot of lie. I mean, you, a lot of these people are basing, basing their relationship, their meaning on lies because the pictures aren't necessarily real. The the uh, bios aren't real. Then they they go out and they meet for a coffee. They don't even recognize each other because the, their pictures are 15 years younger than than, than they are and things like that. People it, are building building people are building themselves deep deep holes when they do this. Yeah, because it's just it's it's a formula for disaster. Yes, I'm sorry. Everybody's doing it. Great. I hope you find someone on the internet. But you know the way to meet someone is not at a bar where you're going to be there for 10 minutes, a half hour, an hour, and everybody's drinking or even worse. And some guy has to come over to a girl and say something ridiculous. Some girl has to come over to a guy and say something ridiculous. That's why I'm doing these three-day weekends. Because people who believe in love and who have everything but love, the man and woman who has everything but love, it's almost like The Bachelor, except without the ridiculousness of one guy and 30 women, how about 15 guys and 15 women coming under one roof for three days, being with each other, learning each other, meeting each other, talking to each other. The key to meeting someone right now is to spend quality time with them. <laughs> it doesn't no, happen in 10 minutes. No, I, I laughed there because this week on the radio, they were talking about solo moons. Have you heard of this yet? No. Solo moons, solo moons are separate honeymoons. Oh. oh. People get married and they're taking separate honeymoons <laughs> because their tastes may differ in what they enjoy doing. You know, it just proves that people can get married. Hey. Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> You can get married, you know, you, oh, oh, Bruce, you love coach, your systems don't work. I know tons of people that got married, and they didn't do this, and they didn't have that. Yeah, you can get married. Good luck. Just because you're married doesn't mean things, mean things are going to work out. No, it's such a funny idea, though, isn't it? Sort of getting married, and then you go on holiday to one place, and your partner goes on holiday to another place. Crazy, it's crazy. <laughs> Oh, gosh. You know, I want to bring sanity back to relationships. Oh, no, 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 now you're getting a little ridiculous. Here. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm old fashioned. I'm a dinosaur. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you're using the analogy of a pie, but wouldn't, wouldn't a, souf a souffle be a lot better? You know, it comes out and you're, you, the first time you see it, it's all beautiful, and then all of a sudden somebody pokes it and <laughs> never to be raised again. Yeah, because, but worse happens than a poke. You know, if it was just a poke, it would be okay. I'd like that system, but it's like that pie is gone, you know, and I, that's why I make it an apple pie. I know we're having fun here, but that's why I make it an apple pie. Cause you can, everybody can relate to an apple pie. And if half that apple pie is gone, 
when you meet someone and you're only offering them this new person who deserves everything from you, if you're only offering them a half a pie, he or she is going to say to themselves, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? I'm like, I'm not getting them. I'm not feeling them. Yeah, it's because you're not offering yourself to the next person because you're so afraid of getting hurt and you're, and you're, you're, uh, you're back in your head about your past and who hurt you and you're worried about the future. The spiritual relationship is about two people meeting up with each other, leaving their past behind, not worrying about the future because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a past. You can't put your finger on it. And focusing on each other. When you're at dinner, have you ever been to dinner with someone and they're just like not there? They're floating off? Hello? It's because they're not there. Yeah. They're half in the past and a half in the future. Yeah. And so little of them is right there. And we've got to get back into our hearts and into our bodies so that we can offer ourselves to someone. When we meet someone, we have something to offer, not just head games. Yeah, and really, really make a connection. Yeah. A solid human. A spirited, soulful connection comes from your heart, not your changing mind. Yeah. So I still keep wanting to revisit this heartbroken teenager. And so how, how can we or you, how can one help some young person in that situation who's just had their heart broken for the first time so that they don't turn into, um, you know, a closed hearted person that just goes from their ego and their, their mind. How, how can we help them not to close their heart or to recover from that? The, the, the first thing that comes to me is to encourage them to get on a spiritual path, to encourage them not to shift up into their heads where they're going to start making choices and decisions based on things rather than, hey, he really makes me feel good. Hey, I laugh when I'm around her or whatever. We have to encourage them not to float off into their heads and start making uh, horse trading ideas. You know, I, if you have this, I'll give you that. If you do this for me, I'll do that for you. There's nothing sexy or, or, or loving about that. So I suggest that if we can keep them focused or introduce them to, to spirituality, introduce them to the God concept, the universe concept of love, and why we came here. We came here to love and to be loved in return. Everything else is all made up, but... We've all fallen for this made up thing. Yeah. We came here for one reason, to learn how to love more and be loved in return. If we can keep that in the forefront of young people's minds, then we have a chance for them not to get caught up in the ego relationships. Yeah. Not easy, not easy, yeah. but that's the way. Not easy, no. And, um, you know, the teenage mind is, the teenager is still growing, aren't they? They're still changing. Their, their chemistry is different. And, um, you know, know let, let, me, let me share with you what is so important about this book. And uh, young people don't, they don't realize that the mistakes they make at 13 and 14 and 15 can hurt them the rest of their lives. Because if they start making wrong choices at 13 and 14 and 15 because they got their heart broken, because they dated too early, they dated too soon, they started having sex too early and sex too soon, by the time they're 18 years old, they're sort of burnt out. Instead of being in their prime when they should be able to meet someone and open up their heart, they're already burnt out if they're making wrong choices as naive teenagers. And that's what this book is about. I tell this girl in the book, as a relationship coach, don't think about, don't, don't take lightly what you're going to do now and think that it doesn't mean anything. Everything that you do as a 13, 14, 15, 16 is going to mean something, is going to make a difference in your life. Try to stay away from making mistakes young and dating too early and 
entering into sexual relationships too early because if it doesn't work out, it's going to hurt you and you're going to start making choices for other reasons as you get older, too, too early in life. Yeah. And that initial wound, it's very much a wound of self-worth, isn't it? You know, it, it, I, I'm unloved. Nobody loves me. I'm all alone. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. I'm not worthy. And so then that you're out looking for another partner just to prove that maybe you're worthy, but because you believe you're unworthy, you're going to just attract more experiences of unworthiness. That's exactly right. Whatever emptiness you need to feel in your life, you're going to keep trying to fill that hole with people, sex, chocolate, whatever it is. Uh, and you, we have to fill that hole ourselves. We can't look for someone else to fill that hole, to give us that excitement, to give us that great sex, to pay for our, school, our, our kids' education, to have us live in a, in a fancy house. It, we didn't come here to be parasites and live off of other people. We came here to be the most successful, loving, kind people that we can. And we can't look for other people and, and the shortcuts that they look for to fill us. We have to fill us. And if it takes going to meditation classes, going to your classes, going to astrology classes, going to yoga classes, going out and hugging trees, walking along the beach, getting back into nature, these are the ways that we get back to our inner selves so that we don't get so caught up in the outer world. But, but there, the, the, the issue there, of course, is that, you know, as, as a young person, you, you learn through experience and from other people, from your peers and from mostly from, you know, like adults in, in your life. And if in most situations, your example is not all that good. And, and so you, you glean from that and you, you bring those learnings into relationships, into looking for that special person into, I mean, my parents, my parents uh, lived, you know, in Holland for two wars. And they used to tell me, Corey, you can bring home a black girl, you can bring home a Chinese girl, you can, but just don't bring home a German girl. You know, and, and so you, 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 uh, Fortunately, I didn't. I didn't take on the, that prejudice, but it's there. You know, like it's it's in the, the back of your mind, and it's constantly f flowing around. I feel bad for the kids today because they really don't have a good role model at all. At all, it's there. No, no it's and they're not, not teaching them in the schools because schools just get them in and get them out as fast as you can because they don't want those kids there anymore. That's why my goal is to get in front of as many high school and college kids as possible before they kind of throw their lives away. Because once you get that heart broken, because you were naive, you picked the, uh, the, the high school uh, captain of the football team thinking that that would be the, the smart way to go, and you picked him because he was popular instead of that you liked him or you loved each other. When you start making choices like that, you're going to end up hurt and broken hearted and it's going to be harder and harder for you to have relationships as you get even a little older and it's going to, you're going to, and you get on that wheel that we talked about, it's going to be very hard to come off. So that's why I want to get in front of high school kids. I want to get in front of college kids and tell them don't rush into things. Don't make mistakes now because those mistakes, don't take it lightly. They could hurt you for the rest of your life. And unless someone can come into your life and help you later on, it's all up to you. It's all on you. And please don't rush into relationships. Stay out of relationships for things and power and glory. Stay in your heart and pick someone who stimulates your heart and not just your mind. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. I think we're coming to the end of our show, Dr. Leslie. Yes, Bruce, thank you so much. And for our listeners, how can they get a hold of you and how can they um, find out about your workshops and your retreats and, and your new book when it comes out? 
I have a website. It's called The Open Heart Movement. The Open Heart Movement. And there's so much information on that website. They can email me at lovecoach, L-U-V coach, not L-O-V-E, L-U-V coach, number one, at gmail.com. Contact me. I can do one-on-one sessions with anyone from anywhere in the world. I want to help you. I want you to get back into your heart. I want to work with your, da- your son, your daughter. I want to work with anyone that wants love in their heart, and I can do it just like you and I are doing here over Zoom, over Skype. And we can have sessions from anywhere in the world, but I am here to help you. All you have to do is reach out to me. Wow, cool. Yeah, you heard it, listeners. So, um, (laughs) yeah, get in touch with Bruce and the Open Heart Movement. You've been been listening to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey and our fabulous guest this evening, Bruce Starr, the love Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Bruce. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to another Unlocking Your Truth podcast by Dr. Leslie Phillips. For more information, go to her website at drleslieyphillips.com. That's drleslieyphillips.com where you can ask questions or send her an email. And there's many free gifts on there for you as well. You can also find the questions that were asked during this show at the website on our free card reading podcast page where you'll find a full list of them. Come back again.